Well, hello, church. Uh, welcome back to our study of church history as we uh, use Nathan Buzanit's, uh study called Forerunners of uh, the Faith. Hopefully you have enjoyed that um, and it's been uh, profitable for you as you continue to study God's word um, on your own and even as we gather together as a church. A little bit of a, of a brief uh, review. Um, our, our first time of actually getting in-depth into this study is we look from, right, we're doing these little sections of different centuries of the church history. We look from the day of Pentecost, uh, which uh, was when the Holy Spirit came and indwelt believers for the first time, and the church is essentially born. Um, and we look from that period to the end of the first century um, with John the Apostle exiled to the um, island of Patmos, where he would eventually write um, the book of Revelation. Uh, we have um, taken a look at the time um, of the uh, the apostles, uh, right, and what that um, what that looked like during that time, and then from there we shifted to uh, those um, who were the disciples of the apostles. Uh, we um, refer to them as the apostolic fathers, right? So these are the uh, church leaders of the early church, um, specifically right after the time of the. Um, apostles, right? We, we looked at um, Clement of Rome, we looked at Ignatius of Antioch, and we also looked at Polycarp of Smyrna. Our last time together, um, the last time we were together last week, um, we moved from that period to moving into the second uh, and mid-third centuries, uh, and we, we took a look at uh, what it meant to contend for um, the faith, um, in particular, um, we looked at kind of a rise in two separate groups of people called um, the apologists, right? And these were people who were, um, though this was always around from the earliest time, but even especially now we have some main names here, the apologists who were defenders of the faith, they, they're known as, specifically from attacks outside of the church, right? So those who did not believe in the Christian God, who did not believe in the Bible, and were attacking the views of the church. So these were the defenders of that truth, the apologists. And we also talked about the polemicists, right? And these were the ones um, who were defending um, the truth from doctrinal errors from those within the church, right? So the polemicists, right? These would be like theological debates uh, on different aspects of scripture. So you have the apologists, those who defended the attacks from outside the church. Um, and then you have the polemicists, those who defended the truth from those inside the church. Um, we, we took a look at Justin Martyr uh, of uh, Ir Ir Irenaeus uh, and Tertullian of Carthage. And then we also took a look at Origen of Alexandria, uh, possibly one of the most influential, influential thinkers of his day, though. And there was much controversy surrounding origin. In there a second ago. Now we're going to kind of turn our attention to uh, moving into the fourth century, right? So after 300 um, AD, uh, and so uh, this the subject of this this uh, uh, lesson is called defending the deity of Jesus Christ, um, Athanasius, and the Council of Nicaea. So that's what we're going to briefly talk about today. Let me go ahead and pray, and we'll jump right in. Father, thank you for this time you're giving us today. We pray that you would be honored with us. Help us to um, just learn and to grow in the knowledge of who you are and how you have preserved your church throughout history. Thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I said, we're kind of moving into um, the fourth uh, century. And, and the fourth century really um, saw a major turning point um, within uh, Christianity. Um, if you remember, um, shortly after Jesus uh, ascended back to heaven, and really um, after um, the stoning of Stephen, even thereafter, um, Christians typically were highly persecuted people. Maybe not uh, immediately initially, because Christianity oftentimes was seen as a... Um, as a offshoot of Judaism, and um, Judaism had a uh, had some religious freedom within the Roman Empire, um, right? The Romans believed in a, a polytheism, right? Multiple gods. Jews believed in, and still today believe in one God, and so they saw Christianity as an offshoot. But as the Jewish people increasingly persecuted. Christians as being a, a heretical cult in their eyes, um, eventually Christianity um, was was no longer within that umbrella of, or no longer seen within the umbrella of Judaism. And for about 250 years, the Christian church um, increasingly, um, and also oftentimes in intermittent waves, faced governmental persecution. 
But after one of the emperors, an emperor named Diocletian, after his reign ended in 305, right, he died in 305, there began this power struggle within the Roman Empire with several different people claiming ownership through to the, th the throne. Several years after that, after 305 AD, a man named Constantine, Constantine I, perhaps you know him as Constantine the Great, uh, he gained control of the Western Roman Empire. He defeated um, a guy named Maximian in 310 and also his son, uh, Maxentius, in 312. Uh, and prior to that vision, Constantine had claimed to see this vision um, and what he was told to conquer in the, the name of the sign of the cross. As a result of that experience, he professed to be a Christian at that time. Uh, and in 313, Constantine and a man named Licinius, who was the Roman emperor in the east, issued the Edict of Milan, which brought peace and legal protections um, to the Christian church. Now, here's what's so significant about this. It's for the last 250 years, as we have said, Christianity um, in intermittent waves had been a persecuted religion, a persecuted people, and in 313 with the Edict of Milan, followers of Jesus, Christians who lived within the Roman Empire, went from being persecuted to now being protected, right? which is a significant thing within the Western world. About 10 years later, in 325 AD, Constantine defeated Licinius, and he became the sole ruler of the entire Roman Empire. Now, in the next year, in 325 AD, uh, Constantine uh, put together a general council of the church in 325 AD, uh, which since the Jerusalem council that we saw in um, Acts chapter 15 had not been held, another church council, at least like this. And so we organized this, and the council met in the city of Nicaea. Now, under uh, 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 something that's also worth noting um, is... Uh, is uh, about 50 years later, the Nicene Christianity under Theodosius the Great, who was another Roman Empire, Christianity was exclusively made the official religion of the Roman Empire, in particular, um, the Christianity of the Nicene Council, which we're going to talk about today. Now, as I said in kind of the introduction to this, right, this is called, this lesson, lesson five is called Defending the Deity of Christ, um, and the subtitle is called Athanasius and the Council of Nicaea, and that's going to be pretty much um, the topic um, of what we're going we're gonna to talk about today, really kind of covering the life of Athanasius and also his influence in, during this time between, um, between 300 to the time of his death towards the end of the 4th century, 373. He lived, Athanasius lived um, from 298 to 373, and he was the pastor of the church in Alexandria, Egypt, right? And if you remember, Origen was actually born in Alexandria, Egypt, and was also trained there as well. Now, in Athanasius' day, right, though there are always things, false teaching, as we said, that the, um, that the, the faithful God's uh, people have always had to fight throughout the centuries, uh, of Athanasius' day, the main subject was the deity of Jesus's Christ, uh, the deity of Jesus of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. Um, and then also a, a related doctrine of his day was also the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, before um, Athanasius became the bishop or the pastor of the church in Alexandria, he served as a deacon under the leadership of a man named Alexander. One of the elders in in that church was a man named Arius, and he began to teach that Christ himself was a created being who was not eternal and therefore was not equal to God the Father. This viewpoint would become known as Arianism, right? It sounds very similar um, to some of the teachings from the Mormon church and also some of the teachings from um, the Jehovah's Witness church as well. They believe some of these very same things. It is not a new issue. Alexander himself condemned Arius for his heretical views, but Arius continued to promote his position. And so um, there was a regional synod, which is like a smaller form of a church council. A region um, was held in 318, and this eventually would lead to the Council of Nicaea meeting in AD 325, involving church leaders throughout the entire Roman Empire. Now, it was actually Roman Emperor Constantine himself who called this um, meeting, and the purpose of it was just to resolve this 
controversy and about 320 bishops or pastors of churches or leaders of churches came um, to debate this issue. Now, though Athanasius was only a deacon in the church um, of Alex that Alexander oversaw at the time, um, his views, that is Athanasius's views, are strongly the same as Alexander's. Now, at this council, um, there were three main positions um, that were put forth to debate on and affirm on by the end of the council uh, of, regarding the deity of Christ. The first was, and here's um, a fancy word for you, um, was the issue that was called heterousios, heterousios, which um, translates as of a different substance. And this was the view put forward by Arian or Arius and his followers. They viewed that Jesus, though he was in some way some kind of divine being, he was of a different substance than the Father, right? So he was kind of like God, but not co-equal, not co-eternal with God, did not share the same authority of God, did not share the same divinity of God. Instead, they viewed that Jesus was, uh, that Jesus, they denied Jesus was God, and they insisted and said that he was a creature. The second main position put forward is called homo usios, homo usios of the same substance. And this was uh, really the response from Athanasius and Alexander towards Arius. Uh, they, they declared uh, unashamedly that Jesus was not a created being, uh, that, he was, uh, th that he was the eternal son of God, that he was co-equal with the Father, and because he was eternal, just like the Father, had the same essence or the same substance as the Father. So they affirm that Jesus is God, teaching that he was not a creature, but it rather is an uncreated, is the uncreated creator. And then there was another view put out there um, that was called homoi, right, as opposed to homo, homoi usios. Homoi usios, and this translates as of a similar substance. And this was kind of like a modified version um, of the first point, which was hetero usios, right? So hetero usios translates of a different substance. Homoi usios translates as of a similar substance. But Alexander and Athanasius also rejected this modified version, which is what Arius eventually began to... Uh, uh, which he kind of held to, he kind of shifted over to the side of this modified version, but they rejected it because uh, it, what it communicated was that though Jesus was similar to God, that he wasn't exactly God, right? He wasn't the same thing as God or the same substance or essence as God. So they rejected that view as well. Now, this church council actually met for weeks and weeks discussing these points and debating about that. Uh, and the overwhelming majority uh, eventually um, came to the position where that Jesus was homo usios, right, of the same, the exact same substance as the Father. And they declared the belief that Jesus was the Son of God. He was co-eternal, co-essential, co-equal with God, the Father. In other words, Jesus was God himself and nothing less. Now, as we look at these uh, realities regarding Jesus, um, here's what's important to understand is what these church leaders were doing is they were answering the question, what do the scriptures say? Right? Because there are, there are things that are confusing, things that are still kind of mysteries about who Jesus is and also the Trinity. And so uh, the, the early church leaders, that sets them apart from false theology is that they weren't asking the question of what do we think Jesus is like? What they were saying is what do the scriptures say about him? What do the scriptures declare about them? And if they did that, so must we. We must take a look. All of our doctrine must be based on scripture. And what they said, what they held to was that Jesus's deity is all throughout scripture. Now, in this curriculum, um, this man, Nathan Boots, and it covers uh, briefly, and we'll just, I'll just name him here in a second, uh, that Jesus's deity is communicated all throughout the Old and the New Testament in 10 specific areas. First, in the area of divine prophecy, right? One particular one is that Isaiah foretold that the Messiah, right? God's redeemer that he would send would actually be mighty God himself. He talks about the divine existence. Jesus explained that he was with the Father in eternity past before the world 
began. So he existed before he was a human. Third, talk about the divine name. Jesus himself called himself the I am, the ego emi, right? That he gave himself God's divine title, the name of Yahweh. Talks about divine authority, right? Jesus claimed to have authority over the Sabbath. He claimed to, to be authoritative over the destinies of people. Uh, and, and even the leaders recognized that he claimed that kind of authority, right? You remember, hopefully, with Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7, when he says, you have heard that it is said, you shall not murder, right? And, and what that meant. And he said, do you remember this? He says, but I say to you, if anybody hates his brother in his heart, that is as good as murder, right? So what Jesus he was doing, he was claiming divine authority. There's also divine power, right? When you look at Jesus' life within the gospel, he had authority over nature, he had authority over demons, and he had authority over sickness and death as well. There's also six, divine ownership, right? Jesus himself claimed that he was God alone. He asserted that God's angels were his angels. An example of that would be Matthew 13, verse 41. He claimed that Jesus, that Israel was, who's God's people, was his people. And he claimed that God's kingdom was his kingdom. There's also divine exaltation. Now, if you remember, when an angel came to this earth, and particularly we see this in the New Testament, right, in this grand view of who this angel is, very quickly, when somebody would fall down to worship that angel, the angel would say, don't worship me, but worship God alone. But when you read the New Testament, when people come to worship Jesus and they give him that kind of due, he doesn't deny it. He actually accepts their worship. There's also the divine titles Jesus applied to himself. He called himself the Son of Man, which was a divine title from Daniel chapter 7. He also called himself the Son of God, being equal with God himself. There's the divine unity, right? If you remember, Jesus said, if you have seen me, that you have seen the Father as well. And then there is divine affirmation. When you look at the rest of the New Testament writings after the life of Jesus, the New Testament clearly communicates that Jesus himself is God in the flesh. So here's primarily what the, the, the early church leaders at the Council of Nicaea, how they, how they affirm the truth of, of, of Scripture. They looked at Scripture and they said, what does it say about Jesus? And the unanimous affirmation was that Jesus himself was God in the flesh. And they condemned the teachings of Arius as heretical and dangerous. Now, even though we look at Scripture as our primary mode of 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 our doctrine, of, of how we form doctrine or how we affirm doctrine. Um, there's also another thing in church history that gives us further proof um, that this is historically what the church believed. It was the witness of church history. Now that is in our primary mode, but it is a good secondary reason, right? You don't just believe tradition just because it's tradition, but when tradition has its support in scripture, it gives great weight to what is being taught. And the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 affirmed what, they had, what the church had always believed. And what they had always believed was these realities about Jesus. So in 106 AD, the Roman governor Pliny the Younger, who was not a believer, he explained that the Christians in his region, they sang to Christ as one would sing to a god. Ignatius of Antioch, who lived from 50 to 117, talked about Jesus Christ um, as, as God. Uh, Polycarp of Smyrna, we've talked about him before, referred to Jesus as God. The, in the epistle of Barnabas, the author there talked about Jesus um, as uh, the one who spoke, uh, as the one who spoke in the beginning of Genesis to make man in our image. Dustin Martyr um, talked about Jesus as both God and Lord of hosts. A guy named Patian in 110 to 117 talked about Jesus as God who was born in the form of man. A man named Alito of Sardis, as he talked about Jesus's crucifixion, he talked about Jesus being the, the one who um, was the slain God hanging naked on a tree. Um, Irenaeus of Lyons, right? We talked about him of Lyon. Um, he talked about Jesus as the, the God, Lord, and eternal King. And there are many others as well. And so all these examples demonstrate that not only was scripture on the side of Jesus's deity, but so was church. History. And so as the council convened at that time in 325 
um, AD, um, they, uh, they affirm the reality of what had always, always been taught, right? They didn't determine what church doctrine was. They affirmed what church doctrine will, always was based off of scripture and based off of historical church testimony. Of the 320 bishops that met there um, to um, debate this issue, only two didn't vote on the Council of Nicaea's decision to support, affirm what they had always believed about Jesus in the beginning. They signed what, it becomes, what became known as the Nicene Creed. Both of those who didn't sign were ardent supporters of Arius. Now, the Nicene Creed is one of the most influential um, creeds in church history. And here's the, the main thrust of it when they wrote it. It says this. You can look up the fullness of it on your own. Because we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of his Father, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both which are in heaven and in earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate and was made man, suffered, and the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven, and he shall come again to judge both the living and the dead. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. Now the main thought in that, that, that uh, Nicene Creed obviously is talking about Jesus, who he is, right? That he is homo usios, of the same substance as the Father, co-eternal, co-essential, and co-authoritative over all. Now, it would be about uh, 50 years later at the, at, uh, at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 um, when the Nicene Creed was expanded to talk more about the Holy Spirit and his work in person. Now, over the next 50 years, though Arian or Arius had been condemned as a church heretic, his views continued to be spread throughout the Roman Empire. Now, it's interesting to note about this man named Athanasius. Many of us don't really know about him, uh, but you can look up information on him. You can look more into his life, and I encourage you uh, to do so. But let me give you some kind of final thoughts about this guy named Athanasius who took up the stand after Alexander. Though um, he uh, was only a deacon at the time of the Council of Nicaea, he spent most of the 4th century fighting the false teachings of Arius. Over the next 45 years of his ministry, he would be exiled five different times, totaling 17 different years or 17 years. Despite being denounced at the Council of Nicaea, Arianism continued to be a popular view within the Roman Empire. And as a result, Athanasius repeatedly found himself in the political crosshairs of his enemies. Now, during the times of his exile, in those five different times, totaling 17 years, it sometimes seemed like Athanasius was all by himself in his fight for doctrine and of Christ's deity. But um, that wasn't so. But it does give us a good indication of who this man was. In fact, some have referred to Athanasius as the saint of stubbornness because he refused to compromise his defense of the truth. And he stood strong in his commitment. Why? Because he stood strongly, firmly planted on the word of God. Now, on a human level, by 380 AD, the emperor Theodosius I outlawed the heretical views of Arius, Arius and he declared the Nicene Trinitarian Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, as we think about these men, Alexander and, and primarily Athanasius, here's one of the things I would just kind of leave you with. Their faithfulness to the scriptures, their rootedness to the word of God are examples to us today. These men earnestly strove for the Christian faith, and their faithfulness sometimes meant that they were unpopular with the world around them. But they, uh, they considered faithfulness to God and faithfulness to his word of the utmost importance that it didn't matter what kind of unpopularity came their way. Their way. And so their faithfulness should motivate us to stand faithfully on the word against the false teachings of the world. And here's why. What do you imagine it would have been like if Arius in that day if they just said, you know what? 
just kind of do what you want and we won't really say anything about it. For all you know, um, we wouldn't have the Council of Nicaea. We wouldn't have the Nicene Creed like we have it today. And perhaps Christianity in many places, in many more places, would be a weakened form of what is true. So we have much to be thankful for in this man named Athanasius, who was a man just like us, and yet a man who stood firmly on the word of God. And I pray that we would do that as well. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the time you have given us to study this. We pray that uh, that we would live faithfully to you, that we would earnestly contend for the faith as this man Athanasius did. That would his example um, motivate us to faithfulness. Lord, thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, church, I love you. I thank God for you. I pray for you regularly. And I pray that you would be encouraged this day and this week. God bless you and have a great day.